Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see you here. I'm Reverend Julie Stoneberg. I'm the interim minister here at UU Church West, and it's really a privilege to be hosting this event and to see all you here. And there are somewhere near, we've been told, 150 people online as well. So it's wonderful that so many people are taking part in this important event. Um, a few things just in terms of, um, well, the very first thing I want to do is just express um, are my gratitude for the work of all the folks who organized this. The Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice, the Wisconsin Council of Churches, Wisdom and MICA, and the Interfaith Co Conference of Greater Milwaukee, the Wisconsin Council of Rabbis, and all of our faith and justice partners across the city and the state and this land. And let me just give you a few, I also would like to just make a, an acknowledgement of the fact that we are here on land that, um, was previously occupied by many different peoples, First Nations. Um, I didn't bring the list with me this tonight and I haven't memorized it. <laughs> so I won't try to say there's about seven of them who um, were part of this land and who took care of this land from time immemorial. And um, it's so important for us to express our gratitude for um, their welcome to this land and to acknowledge that those of us who are not indigenous have really benefited from what was a tragic history for them. So it's just an important thing to note as we begin. A couple of um, housekeeping things. Um, if you didn't notice the washrooms, there's a all gender single use washroom on the, this side of the coats area and there are gendered washrooms just on the other side of the coats area. And please feel free to um, make use of them and make yourself comfortable in any way that you need to. And speaking of being comfortable, for some people these chairs are uncomfortable. And so we have a stack of cushions by the back door there, and or the sanctuary doors. And please grab one if you need one anytime. They're there for your use. Many of us, I think, have heavy hearts today with hearing the news of um, the massive earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. And it would be just um, disrespectful of us not to begin our time tonight by paying attention, pouring out our hearts for the people there and for all the destruction and death, a huge death toll at this point, all that sadness and tragedy and trauma for the peoples there who are already living in such disrupted situations already. I just ask that we hold a moment of silence for all the people there. May they be well, may they find peace. When Unitarians gather, Unitarian Universalists gather, we light a chalice, which is a flame held in a cup. It can stand for and I invite you to have it stand for what matters to you this evening. It often represents the common cup of community, a container for what we share and what we hold together. It represents the flame of hope and truth, a fire of commitment, the light of love. So whatever you need to hear or feel this evening, may it be held in that cup. And the chalice can also hold all of us, whoever we are, whatever our beliefs, whatever our fears, whatever we come with tonight. As I light the chalice this evening, I use words crafted from those of uh, Melanie Davis and Molly, Molly Brewer. My beloved people, I cannot pretend and so I will not tell you that everything is okay right now, that there's no reason to be, no, that there's no reason to be angry, that you must be optimistic or at peace. I cannot pretend these things, so I won't tell them to you. And so all I would ask in this moment is that we remember in the words of a song, there is a love, there is a love holding us. There's a love holding all. Let us rest in this love. And let us find sparks of hope 
for if ever there were a time for a candle in the darkness, this would be it. Using a spark of hope, may we kindle the flame of love, ignite the light of peace, and feed the flame of justice. And with that, I will turn the evening over to Lisa Jones, who is the executive director of MICA and also the lead organizer there. And she's going to tell us a lot more about why we're here and what we can look forward to this evening. Thank you, Reverend Stolmberg. So why are we here? We are here because we know that there are still injustice in the world and there is lots to do in the world. That's why we're here. And let me just tell you how we got here and how this event uh, came to, to be. So there is a, um, a partnership of faith-based groups that have been working together for, oh, it's almost two years now. I mean, we did work before, but we've really intentionally been working together, meeting weekly, for almost two years. And we came together realizing that some of the work that we were doing, the advocacy, the grassroots organizing, really wasn't as impactful and effective as it should be. And we started to realize it's because of the white supremacy that's been going on in the world and that unfortunately has impacted um, our public sphere and even um, our political systems. And so what could we do as faith partners together? What could we learn together? What could we mobilize? And so then it started off with just discussions on trying to figure things out. And then what happened was when we started to hearing about, we couldn't talk about the truth because it would impact children and make them feel bad. And when we started to, hear that and then some of the things that uh, people were reaching out for help across the state of Wisconsin, we realized this is where we need to be. And then from that, the Creating Beloved Community team creating, uh, taking a faithful stand for equity so that we could start meeting monthly, mobilizing people across the state so that they could start engaging in work in their own local community, whether it's school boards or common councils, wherever it need to be, and so that they could have their justice voice heard and started to, to work together. So that's been going on for about the last uh, two years. And so when we heard that there was a Faith and Democracy tour, we said, that needs to be here. <laughs> that needs to be here in Wisconsin. That needs to be because, because the threat to democracy is, is very great right now. And so uh, we as people, as faith, have been trying to figure out what we need to do when we know that we need to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And so that's where this event is. And, and this is not going to be the end of it when this event is over. We're going to keep doing the work and we're going to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper until there is no more oppression. That's what we're going to be keep on doing, and that's part of, the, of living out our faith values. So I have the, the pleasure of uh, introducing our, our speaker, who will give a presentation to, to tell us more of, about uh, what's been going on and, and, what, and how we need to show up in the world. So uh, Reverend Jennifer Butler is a founding executive director in residence, right? Yes, founder in residence. Founder in residence in, of Faith and Public Life and the former chair of the White House Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Before Faith and Public Life, Jennifer spent 10 years working in the field of international human rights representing the Presbyterian Church at the United Nation and is an ordained minister. While mobilizing religious communities, 
to address the AIDS pandemic and advocating for women's rights, she grew passionate about the need to counter religious extremism with a strong religious argument for human rights. Out of that experience, she wrote Born Again, the Christian Right Globalized, which was published by University of Michigan Press. That book calls for a progressive religious response to religious right efforts to take the culture wars global. Jennifer served in the Peace Corps from 1989 to 1991 in a Mayan village in Belize, Central America, where she discovered she was a community organizer at heart. A graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary, she also studied public policy and community organizing and graduated with a MSW from Rutgers University. She is a graduate of the College of William and Mary. Jennifer loves hiking and biking with her family and friends. And I present Reverend Butler. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that introduction and for all of your organizing and to Reverend Julie for that beautiful grounding and opening us up in um, prayer and remembrance. I am so excited to be in this state. If you all haven't noticed, you're ground zero for democracy. No pressure or anything. <laughs> but the good news is you're not alone and I run a network uh, Faith and Public Life or cr created a network that has 50,000 religious leaders around the country. And I know well the landscape of most of the states in the United States of America. We've worked in most states. And I will say, Wisconsin ranks one of the top. Look at all the organizations that have pulled this together. And Wisconsin is legendary for its organizing and particularly its faith organizing. So you're the model for the rest of the country. Again, no pressure or anything. but. In my work at Faith and Public Life, I once joined the activist group Moms Rising to bear moral witness to the horrific child separation policy that was happening at the border. It was 2018, and we were at a congressional hearing on homeland security, and we carried with us baby onesies with the names of the children that had died in detention centers along the border. I waited tensely in line to get into the hearing room and I looked at the names on the onesie. Alexander, age 11. Alexis, age eight. Andy, age seven. Dixiana, age 10. Franklin, age 11. Laya, age one. Jose, age five. Reverend Butler, I jumped. Suddenly, the chief of Capitol Hill Police was standing in front of me with his little white cap and white uniform. He knows my name, I thought. Whoops, then I realized I had a record. I had been arrested for refusing to remove myself from Senator Mitch McConnell's door stoop while he was trying to gut the Affordable Care Act. I told the chief of police, I'm just here attending this hearing with other moms. And he actually had a phone to his ear and he was listening intently. He removed the phone and he said, well, Reverend, I'm being told if you hold that onesie up in the hearing, you will be arrested. It was clear he was on the line with a congressional staffer who was not so eager to see that onesie on national television. Imagine that the power of a onesie to strike fear into the hearts of Congress. But it was, of course, more than the onesie. It was a fear of a moral vision rising. It's no secret Christianity is facing some challenging moral times, to say the least. Our vision feels hazy. As a Christian and as a pastor, I'm deeply concerned. I've been asked today to talk about the history of the Christian right and how it has evolved into Christian nationalism. And I want to preface my remarks by saying that this moment we're taking here to remember our history and understand how we got here 
It is a spiritual practice, a spiritual discipline that enables us to achieve a greater vision and understanding of how to exactly heal our broken and polarized communities. Understanding our history and empathizing with those oppressed is one of the most mentioned spiritual disciplines in the Bible. Remember, you were once slaves and I freed you. It's the foundation of all the law. Only when we remember our community story can we actually live into the abundant promises that God offers us. Like most histories, Christianity is complex. Christians were at the forefront of the abolition movement, making scriptural cases against slavery even as they organized legislatively. Christians were at the forefront of the Christian of the civil rights movement, making the moral case against Jim Crow. And Christians were also at the forefront of the white nationalist movement that erected a gallows at the Capitol grounds on January 6th. What is the history that we must know to help us understand that how the Christian right became Christian nationalism, a movement so extreme and radicalized that they believe our nation is a Christian nation now under siege by Jews and by people of color and must be taken back and dominated? It's hard to even hear those words because it's just so extreme. First, let, let's understand what Christian nationalism is. Jamar Tisby, a New York Times bestselling author of a book on racism and religion, writes, Christian nationalism is an ethno-cultural ideology that uses Christian symbolism to create a permission structure for the acquisition of political power and social control. Now that is a mouthful. So let me say it again, and you have it up on the slide. Christian nationalism is an ethnocultural ideology. It is not religious, it's an ideology, but it uses Christian symbolism. And why does it do that? To seize power and social control. That's what it's about power and control. The conflation of national or ethnic identity is by no means new. It happens in all religions of the globe and often with violent consequences and throughout human history. Christianity became the imperial religion when the Roman Emperor Constantine consolidated his power and founded the Catholic Church way back in the fourth century. And throughout the Middle Ages, Christians used false allegations that Jews were murdering Christian children and using their blood to make matzah in order to justify purges and attacks on Jewish communities. The medieval religious wars known as the Crusades and the conquests of Americas in Africa were done under the flag of Christianity. And the Pope's doctrine of discovery in 1493, note that year, 1493, uh, were used, was used to justify and claim the colonizing of non-Christian lands. Christianity was to be exalted and spread so that, quote, barbarous tribes and nations could be overthrown and saved by the religion of their conquerors. With all of that came power, control, and wealth. In the Americas, slavery and the genocide of Native Americans were justified in the name of Christianity, and missionaries were used to placate and manipulate and assimilate non-white populations. Again, power, control, and wealth. Remembering this history helps explain some alarming new studies about American attitudes toward Christian nationalist belief. In a recent University of Maryland poll, fully 61% of Republicans and 38% of the overall population supported declaring the United States a Christian nation. An in-depth study by Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry found that a fifth of the population are ambassadors or hardcore supporters who believe America should, be, uh, should officially declare itself a Christian nation and dissolve the separation of church and state. That's one in five Americans. And 32% are actually accommodators of that belief, meaning that they're open. They have an open mindset toward it and they're flirting with some of the ideas around it. So these ideas are embedded in our historical DNA, and bad actors can really bring them to the surface. And there's another more recent white Christian nationalism origin story. 
one about a movement that arose in the 70s and 80s and quickly came to dominate American politics and religion, so much so that the legacy of religious progressives was eclipsed. A lot of us think of this movement that was led by the self-proclaimed moral majority as having started with the Supreme Court ruling on abortion, Roe v. Wade, in 1973. Yet at that time, Protestants, writ large, had a very supportive position toward women's right to choose. Even the conservative Southern Baptist Convention had a policy that was open to women's making decisions about her health, their health care and their bodies. It's hard to believe, but you can Google it and find it on the internet. It's there. So, in fact, the Christian right didn't arise out of concerns about abortion. It actually galvanized in response to a 1971 Supreme Court ruling that, up, that upheld an IRS decision to deny tax-exempt status to private Christian academies that segregated. It was segregation, not abortion, that founded the Christian right. Then in 1976, the IRS actually rescinded the tax exemption of Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina, and sued for almost a half a million in back taxes. Ouch. <laughs> this watershed event is what kicked off the rapid growth of the Christian right, but the story didn't end there. White Christians were outraged and galvanized white voters to help elect Ronald Reagan instead of the born-again evangelical Jimmy Carter. They elected Reagan. Why? Their votes paid off because the Reagan Treasury soon announced that the IRS would no longer deny tax exemptions to private schools that practiced racial discrimination. So they rolled back that policy. Fortunately, just a year later, the Supreme Court, in a unified decision, I know that's hard to believe, Eight to one upheld the government's right to revoke tax-exempt status from any school that discriminated. Reagan's IRS had to comply with that ruling. So Bob Jones University had claimed that the Bible justified seg segregation. They literally claimed that. The Bible justified segregation to them. So that day in chapel, Bob Jones III lamented that America was doomed our nation from this day forward, he said, is no better than Russia insofar as expecting the blessings of God is concerned. You no longer live in a nation that is religiously free. Jones believed that he had a religious right to segregate, and without this right, God would actually damn America. There's perhaps no better example than, the conf than this of the conflation between um, Christian beliefs and national identity than that statement right there. What Bob Jones was also mourning was the death of decades of using Christian private schools to segregate, even as the courts tried to resegregate, I mean, re uh, integrate. As the civil rights movement began to have an impact, Southern legislatures had enacted as many 450 laws and resolutions to evade desegregation, and chief among them were voucher programs that essentially siphoned off public school funding to white private schools. So today, the language of school choice, which is used alongside voucher programs, sounds really good. It sounds really innocent. But once you put that in the long years, the historical context, the white Christian context, and analyze the winners and losers of that policy, the deceptive intent becomes clear. It's been used for decades to keep us segregated and to deny resources to communities of color. The white, wealthy the white kids win and poor white kids and black kids and people of color uh, lose. And the next gener generation is allowed to hold on to power, control, and wealth. This is something Wisconsin knows well. This issue of vouchers was front and center this last gubernatorial election. And today, exactly the same percentage of Milwaukee's black school children attend hyper-segregated schools, as was the case in the mid-1960s. Schools were desegregated thanks to court orders, 
and initiatives like busing during the 60s and the 70s, as you can see on this graph. And they began to resegregate through the Reagan 80s as the Christian rights power grew. Today, Milwaukee not only leads the nation in black children attended hyper, attending hyper-segregated schools, it also posts the highest rates of black children attending what Gary Orfield has called apartheid schools, schools where 99% of the children are minorities. And you can see that graph tracks exactly with that earlier timeline on the rise of the Christian right and the use of uh, vouchers which they were in, in school choice, which they were able to bring back into the political system. Now, the Christian right didn't figure out these strategies just on their own. It wasn't like an organic movement that arose out of nowhere. It was political power brokers that were key in identifying leaders and channeling massive amounts of money to their leaders. And these operatives also saw that they had to cloak their racism and their, their goals around segregation by bringing in other issues. And so what they needed was a new boogeyman, and they found it by cultivating abortion and anti-LGBTQ sentiment as a religious rallying cry. Over time, the, the Christian right became a coalition defined by abortion, family values, anti-LGBTQ activism, but the racist right and Christian nationalists remained the base of the movement, and their interests around race were met through racist dog whistles rather than overt talk of segregation. So over time, some sectors of the Christian right became more radicalized and violent. And we saw this early on when abortion clinics were targets of abortion and in the Oklahoma City bombing. All of this was playing out across increasing economic insecurity and rapid social diversification. And it scared a lot of pe white people who felt that they would be replaced by black and brown people. This replacement theory, of course, was alleged to be um, orchestrated by the elite Jewish cabal, hence the chant at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017, Jews will not replace us. So all of that is integrated, coming full circle with the Middle Ages and these pogroms and uh, assaults on Jewish communities. But I'm getting ahead of myself because nothing drove the point home more than the election of Barack, the election of Barack Obama. And the hard right saw this election as an opportunity to stoke more fear and resentment. Donors, many of them motivated by economic interests, poured money into the Tea Party, formed just a year into Obama's administration. And the Tea Party created a cottage, cottage industry of groups that hyped Islamophobia in the wake of 9-11 and the conspiracy theory called birtherism, the lie that Obama was born in Kenya and a Muslim and even in league with ISIS. And of course, Donald J. Trump, became the primary promoter of birtherism. When Trump was elected, his overt embrace of the racist right and use of authoritarian and Christian symbols gave a big green light to the worst uh, and the most extreme resentment and fear. And Trump didn't invent, of course, any of these isms. And certainly other modern presidents embraced the Christian right but they treaded carefully when it came to overt racist and anti-Semitic remarks and comments and spread the spread of violence. Trump pulled the lid off and made it okay. This really strengthened the hand of extreme, Christian extremists, unleashing it violence and even an insurgency, and some even hope for what they call a racial holy war. This symbiotic relationship with Trump also fed some new groups if you can believe it, more extreme than the original groups that made up the Christian right. One of them is called the New Apostolic Reformation, which emerged out of Pentecostal and charismatic movements, although they're rejected by many of the mainstream denominations from Pentecostalism. NAR, as it's called, focuses on signs and wonders and extra biblical revelation, judgment, modern day prophets, and apocalypticism. It has meshed well with conspiracy theories like QAnon, which claims that elites are conspiring to destroy the American freedom and submit the country to a world government, one in which the elites practice pedophilia, blood sacrifice, and Satanism. And all of what I just said goes back again to these old conspiracy theories 
around blood sacrifice, blood libels, anti-Semitism, and using that to whip up fear in order to oppress other people. They may sound easy to dismiss, but their goal is to make the United States a Christian theocracy. They're very explicit about this. Uh, and to take over different spheres of influence that they call the seven mountains. Those include education, religion, family, business, government, and military, and arts, and entertainment, and media. They have 3.5 million members in the United States. And NAR has engaged with some pretty high-profile political figures like Sarah Palin, Rick Perry, Trump's uh, presidential faith advisor, Paula White Kane, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, Michael Flynn, and Roger Stone. Whew. Take a deep breath. It's a lot. So the rise of the Christian right is not the only part of the story. There's another part of the story to be told, and it's a story about us and how we reacted to the Christian right. We lost our voice. As secular progressives countered the Christian right on First Amendment grounds, which they needed to do, Christians, including Christian progressives, allowed ourselves to be falsely convinced that the separation of church and state meant that we couldn't convey the religious grounding for the policies that we advocated for. We stopped investing and communicating our positions publicly from a place of faith, and we failed to intercept right-wing donors that were funding insurrections within our own denominations and silencing our voices. Our dampened public voice was eclipsed to the de detriment of our democracy and to the detriment of the faith of millions of people who left congregations in frustration at our bigotry and intolerance or inability to take a justice stand. I'd like to close with what we do to reclaim and to close with a, a word of hope. What do we do with this remembering that we've done today and with the enormity of it all? I have a lot of hope, actually, as I look around this room and given what I'm seeing across the country. Let's keep in mind, for one thing, that tyrants hijack religion because its teachings threaten their claim on power, control, and wealth. When we reclaim our traditions and teach them as the radical texts that they are truly meant to be, our communities can be inoculated against authoritarianism and empowered and given courage to challenge it. Consider, for example, the creation story, nothing short of a radical moral critique of ancient beliefs about how and why the earth was created. The creation story makes an audacious and radical and beautiful claim that human beings were not created to be slaves as was believed in that time, but human beings were created in the very image of God. This was a system that justified liberation rather than a system that justified tyranny. Instead, we're actually created in God's image and think how powerful that would have been and how challenging to the emperors of that day for that belief system to arise. I argue in my book, Who Stole My Bible, that taking back our scriptures and actually humanizing other people and restoring their dignity is one of the spiritual superpowers that we have that can resist tyranny. The prophet Habakkuk, who experienced something similar to what we're experiencing today, received a word from God to write down the vision and write it clearly on clay tablets so that whoever reads it can run and tell others of God's vision of abundance for everyone. In other words, what we need to do is take back our voice. Today, we don't have tablets and a runner. We have 24-7 news and social media, for better or for worse. And we have our voice. And with it, we must paint a clear moral vision of how things can be and spread that news everywhere. I've seen what a moral vision can do. Remember those onesies that struck fear into the heart of Capitol Hill. They illustrate the power of our collective voice rising. Last August, I saw this clear moral vision in action when I went and witnessed the Reawaken America tour 
which is headlined by the disgraced General Michael Flynn, this Christian nationalist tour. It came to Batavia, New York, and it was hosted by these NAR churches. It was a beehive of misinformation and conspiracy theory and Christian nationalism trolling America right before the midterm elections. But I had the honor of joining with local clergy who were teaming out to speak out against Reawaken America's far right and white nationalist leaders. And I felt myself in awe of the power of people of different faiths coming together despite threats to their safety to lift up a vision of this nation in which all faiths and all races benefit from the abundance and dignity that God gives us. Throughout American history, white Christian nationalism has resurged. Slavery was met with the faith of abolitionists and segregation was countered with the clergy voices of the civil rights movement. Its resurgence today must be met with diverse faith voices speaking loudly and organizing. So now is the time for our moral voice, again, to call this nation to her better angels and remember and restore the teachings of our faiths. So let's write that vision and make it plain. Thank you. Well, thank you, Reverend Butler, for, for that, um, that talk of talking about where, where we go from here and to reclaim. Isn't that a wonderful word, reclaim? Reclaim? So, um, so now what we're going to be doing is we're going to, we wanted to, as, as Reverend Butler was talking about, uh, talking about the country as a whole and the history, we wanted to bring a panel together that would talk about what we can do and some of the things that are actually going on here locally in Milwaukee, the greater Milwaukee area, that we, we really need to know what's going on and how what's going on nationally and how that's impacting us here and so that we can get engaged in, uh, in that work. So we're going to have uh, three wonderful panelists that are going to be coming up. I will introduce uh, the first one, and then we'll have them come speak, and then I'll introduce the next one. So we have the first panelist I would like to um, introduce to come up and speak just for a few moments, and they will do a longer introduction of themselves. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Reverend uh, Joseph L. Winger, uh, who is retired uh, Evangelical Lutheran um, Church of America pastor. He's an author and civil rights activist, and he was a key figure in the civil rights uh, movement in Birmingham, Alabama, and he is a giant uh, in MICA. He's one of the founders of MICA, and he's helped found some of the wisdom uh, affiliates, but I wanted to have him come up and, and tell his perspective of where he sees white Christian nationalism from, from the past to where it is right now and where we need to go. So if he, he can come up for a few minutes, Pastor Elwinger. And as he comes up, if you think of any kinds of questions that you would like to think of, there are people who have note cards and who will give you a pencil, and then at the end, when the panel comes down, you can ask further questions, including um, Reverend Butler. Pastor Owinger. I understand I have five minutes, is that right? Something like that. Eight? Ooh. Oh, that's dangerous. But um, yes, I I had the privilege of uh, beginning my ministerial work as parish pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Birmingham, Alabama, in 1958. I was there from 58 to 67, an African American congregation in Southwest Birmingham, and. Uh, that, as the Haitian proverb goes, it, we see from where we stand. I stood as a person living in and walking with the African American community, living under Jim Crow, 
and looking at what is called white na Christian nationalism, uh, I see a, 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 a real direct line from the Jim Crow uh, attitudes to uh, the very present. And as, as many have said, uh, we really need to talk about this uh, white Christian nationalism as maybe white religious or white ideod ideological uh, uh, nationalism because it's not Christian, as it's pointed out. It, it is an ideology. It certainly is not in line with everything from uh, the Genesis passage that says that everyone is created in the likeness of God, which was quoted a moment ago, uh, to uh, the Beatitudes of Matthew 5 and, uh, and the life and the witness of, uh, of Jesus, uh, who from the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, this so-called white Christian nationalism is, is anything but Christian. Uh, and the connection between Birmingham uh, 1960s and uh, white ideological uh, nationalism is so direct that it's, it, it's, uh, it, it hits you in the face. Uh, and the one aspect of uh, the civil rights uh, movement in the 60s that is, was so important and which is so important today uh, is the one aspect of this nationalism that I would like to lift up. There's so much more that could be talked about. But it's not by accident that one of the people on the far right bragged, and some of you saw this in the paper, uh, bragged about uh, uh, getting the Milwaukee, city of Milwaukee people uh, to turn out 40,000 people less in the last election because of the great work that they did. And what was their great work? It was the great work of the attack ads and uh, the, uh, the myths and the uh, fallacies and the story that uh, we, uh, they're taking our Christian faith away from us, all of these people who are taking over our country, Jews, Muslims, blacks, and it, people got sucked up into that. But the fact that the far right and the nationalists uh, work at reducing people's ability to, to vote is not by accident. And uh, the voting rights movement in the 1965, where I was most deeply involved, uh, is a clear indication of how important and close the right for everyone to vote is connected with everyone is created in God's image and uh, everyone counts, everyone's vote counts, everyone's voice counts, everyone, everyone. That's what we were fighting for in the 1960s. Uh, and as C.T. Vivian said at a, uh, a Crossing the Bridge uh, Bloody Sunday Memorial about uh, three years ago, he said, Yes, we were voting, we were pushing and working hard for uh, the, the right to vote, 
But what we were really working for, he said, underneath it all was for the, the, uh, the dignity of every human being. Uh, because the vote, rep the vote for everybody represents exactly that if, indeed, everyone has the right to vote, regardless of color, regardless of income, regardless of previous in incarceration record. Everyone counts. Everyone has dignity. That is the moral imperative of the true Christian faith and of all religions that recognize the value of every human being. And so uh, we have to definitely uh, work on keeping it, uh, the right to vote at the very forefront of our fight against Christian nationalism. And uh, the uh, end of my speech has just been indicated. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm rising in, uh, in my fervor and my passion here because uh, if there's any one thing that we need to do and must do to fight uh, this ideological white nationalism, it is to make sure that everyone has the right to vote, is encouraged to vote, and gets out there and votes, and if I act, am acting like somebody trying to get people out to vote, I'm going to uh, propose that everyone here tonight talks to at least 10 people to get them to vote, because it's that important. Thank you, uh, Reverend Owinger. I think that uh, we, ha we have our marching orders, right? We got to go out there and get out the vote, right? So, um, so thank you for that. And um, on our next um, panelist that I would like to um, bring up and introduce, I would like to introduce uh, Pastor Dr. Uh, Richard Shaw, who serves as the proud pastor of St. Matthew uh, CME Church in Milwaukee. And as a pastor, preacher, teacher, and social activist, uh, he's led his congregation into a renewed and revived spirit that has brought excitement and fulfillment to St. Matthew. And he is also, too, the new president of MICA. So, Dr. Shaw. Good evening, everyone. It is an honor to be here with you today unfortunately having to have this conversation, uh, but it is extremely necessary. As an African American growing up in the South and hearing the stories of racism and um, brutality that was taken out on people, here we are in 2023, we're having these discussions about taking uh, quote, our country back. Taking our country back to where? When I think about the history of this country, it really frightens me of the idea of taking us back or taking back our country because there were things that took place. Those who deem themselves Christians, but yet enslaved people. Those who deem themselves Christians, but yet prevented people from their right to vote. And as I was thinking about this white Christian nationalism, and I think about how a certain group of people hijacked Christianity, put their own twist on it for political benefit. And when I think about the dangers of it, it concerns me even greater. It is dangerous to the black community because of the manipulation and deception of faith as it relates to the core values of many African-Americans 
as well as brown and other minorities. It is no secret that in the black church, we still wrestle with things like abortion and homosexuality in terms of having those discussions. So what did they do? They packaged their agenda and wrapped it up in an anti-abortion wrapping paper and put an I love Jesus bow on it <laughs> that caused many African-American pastors as well as African-American Christians to embrace this ideology and to move with it and go for it, but they never looked in the package to see the real agenda. The agenda that has led to mass incarceration, the agenda that has led to voter suppression, the agenda that has led to extreme hardship for those that scripture tells us to look out for. And so when I think about a righteous right, I have to think about the scripture when Jesus talked about who was righteous. He said, those who fed me when I was hungry, those who visited me when I was in prison and sick, those who uh, was there for me. But yet, here we are today dealing with white Christian nationalism, where it is taking us back decades, taking us back decades, and now we have to continue the fight, continue to fight to, to change the narrative, to change the narrative of who we are as a faith community. Because if we sit back and do nothing, we have just given over all of our rights, our lives, our dreams, to a group of individuals who want to dominate and control. And that's what it's about. Dominating biblical interpretation, dominating even the interpretation of who Christ is, dominating people. So I say today to the faith community, let us resist. Let us resist because if we don't resist, then we'll conform. One of my favorite quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King is that, and I paraphrase, the absence of brutality is not the presence of justice because injustice comes in many faces, it comes in many shapes, and in many forms. And so we have to take back. We have to take back the teachings that Christ and in other faith traditions have taught us to love, to love one another. And love does not uh, oppress people. Love does not tear people down. But love builds up. Love is, it goes beyond us. But it reaches those who live on the margins. And so as a faith community, we have to, we have to stand up. And I, I'll say this last thing. Marvin McMickle, in his book, Where Have All the Prophets Gone? He challenges the poor pits, and particularly the black poor pits, to bring back the prophetic voice that spoke truth to power. Not the prophet voice that, that, is, that generates revenue in our churches, but the prophet, the prophetic voice that calls into accountability those who continue to invest and work hard to keep people down. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shaw, for reminding us about that prophetic voice that we need to carry forth. And now I um, would like to introduce uh, Reverend Eric uh, David Carlson, who serves as the lead minister at Bradford Uni Universalist Unitarian Church in Kenosha. 
and who is a lifelong um, UU and who has held uh, several leadership positions at every level of the association in his uh, denomination. And he also has um, serves uh, on the Religious Leader Caucus on our sister affiliate, um, CUSH, which is Congregations United to Serve Humanity. And, um, and I know that they've gone through a number of different things in our own local context. And I welcome him uh, to the podium to finish introducing himself and telling us what's been happening in Kenosha. Pastor? Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. It is an honor to be among such uh, esteemed colleagues as these and uh, here in a wonderfully comfortable place for me. I send greetings from my wife, Kimberly Tomchak Carlson, who was the, did her student ministry in this building before her ordination. So uh, welcome from the, the whole Carlson family. So again, I'm Eric David Carlson. I use the pronouns he, him, and his, and I am blessed to be part of the ministry team at Bradford Community Church, Unitarian Universalist in Kenosha. And uh, our congregation has always been committed to justice. One of the reasons we came out of uh, came out of obscurity is because of our commitment to the Social Concerns Committee of Kenosha. And uh, our folks helped found both the local Planned Parenthood branch and our wisdom affiliate, Cush, uh, as well as establishing Kenosha's Coalition for Dismantling Racism. And all this happened a couple decades at least before I became the pastor there in 2016. And relevant to our discussion tonight, over the last several years, we've had really a front row seat to the rise of white nationalism, responding regularly to issues of racial violence even prior to finding ourselves at the epicenter of the Jacob Blake protests and the Kyle Rittenhouse shootings, and then, of course, the devastating trials that, uh, that resulted from both of those events. We've seen self-appointed militiamen carrying guns down our streets dressed like soldiers and holding signs that would be closely mirrored months later at the Capitol on January 6th. We've heard politicians like Biden and Trump comment publicly about our situation while knowing very little about the situation there to very different conclusions. We've lamented the decision of the Kenosha County Board recently to declare us a Second Amendment sanctuary allowing open carry in all county buildings and on all county property. And this despite overwhelming opposition from the general population and the city government and the local law enforcement. And most recently, we've seen our neighborhoods pamphleted with hateful anti-Semitic flyers aimed specifically at our local synagogue and a partner. She came out all she could see were state troopers. Now, today Marion is a, is a town with um, a population of 3,000 people. So where in the world did all the state troopers come from? Uh, but to speed it up, they knew they, uh, that she ran the cafe. They forced her to open up the cafe and they began to push people into, and the name of that cafe was Max Cafe, named after my grandmother, Eunice McLaughlin. And so to make a long story short, uh, she was actually arrested that night uh, and taken to jail, but, but then you know they moved on from that. In 2010, 2010 my mother passed in 2010, and six months uh, before she passed, she was able to witness the state trooper who actually shot Jimmy Lee Jackson be convicted. And that was in 2010. So that, yes, that's my, my background, and that has also inspired me mm. in the work that I do. Participated in my first uh, protest, I think I was seven years old. <laughs> I, I would just have to ask, and maybe any of the other panelists, just like we heard from what, what Dr. Shaw said, um, 
what you heard him just say, how is that different to, than what is, what is today when we have Kyle Rittenhouse who is walking down um, a, a main street in Kenosha with, a, with a, I believe, an AR-15? Any, anyone want to comment on that? Well, I think, you know, it, it, there's a parallel there to Officer Shevsky and, uh, and Jacob Blake. Um, Officer Shesky was um, acquitted of all charges several months before the Rittenhouse trial even began. Mm -hmm. And it was a, you know, kind of important uh, foretelling of what was to come. And we in the faith community knew that if Shesky weren't convicted, um, we had very little chance of getting justice with, uh, with Kyle. And so we were better prepared maybe to respond to the Rittenhouse trial. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't easy and we were, you know, right to be disappointed and right to be concerned. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your question is really kind of a statement. You're right. You know, the parallels are clear. Another thing that, um, people are tracking is that a lot of police departments and National Guard had been sort of penetrated by white supremacist groups and people, and um, that presents a threat. And then, of course, our politicians are weaponizing people um, as well, you know, for acts of violence. And so it's a very explosive situation and has a lot of parallels to that day. Okay. All right. Um, I know, Reverend Butler, uh, you've done a lot of um, work and, of course, activism and community organizing. Um, how do you think um, the church's response, especially when, when um, we are taught, taught so much to be that uh, the church is not supposed to be political or concerned that we're getting too much involved in certain kinds of issues or going a certain way, how do you answer people when you, when you get asked those kinds of questions? Well, for one thing, I say the gospel is political, right? Scripture is political. Jesus said, <laughs> thank you. Jesus said, I've come to bring good news to the poor and freedom to the oppressed, and then they tried to throw him off a cliff, right? So there's that. And then what does politics mean? It means um, how we organize our communities, basically. How, how we live together is the polis is like the people and the, the will of the people and how they come together. And uh, so we treat politics like it's something dirty, but it's really just how we organize ourselves. And God says, organize yourself so that every human being can flourish and every human being is treated with dignity and respect. And so it is our mission as people of faith to be engaged in politics, not to be partisan, to be clear, right? Politics doesn't mean that you endorse a political party. It means you bring your values for the sake of the community and to organize the community behind the values that all of our faith and ethical traditions hold dear, which is human dignity and human flourishing for everybody and for the planet. There was a great uh, Unitarian Universalist minister in the 19th century named Thomas Starr King, and he went up and down the California coast and is credited with almost single-handedly preventing California from becoming a slave state when it was admitted to the Union. And uh, he once was challenged about why he preached politics. And he said, I won't preach politics, but I am compelled to preach humanity. And whenever I have to deal with something political, I think about that. I think about how does this affect the human beings in this room, and how can I speak to them? Yes, um, I would say when we think about the church and its involvement or how we view politics, I really don't see a way around it, especially when you are a church in a community where there are so many challenges. And to say that we are followers of Christ or whatever your faith tradition may teach, to sit back and do nothing um, is, is not the right thing to do. I want to say is, is, is actually shameful and a disgrace. When I think about the term, 
uh, law and order. As an African-American pastor, father of two African-American young men, I understand what law and order means. Law and order is not, is not um, aimed at um, young white boys, but black, brown, and poor. In other words, anyone who goes against our politics, the threat, then this is how we handle them. We, we put law and order on them. But for us, this is our Christian right because we're doing this in the name of Jesus. And that's the doctrine that the church has to address. I believe because of the importance of faith that we have to address misinterpretations of Christ as well as the Bible. Not to take up too much time, when I think about the book of Revelations, there are those who focus on the lion. But there's a lamb. There's a lamb. There's a slain lamb that we oftentimes ignore and never talk about. When it comes to the question about political involvement, I think uh, the way we need to look at this as religious people is that we're called to serve justice and to fight injustice. Uh, that's all through not only the uh, Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures, but uh, all the other scriptures as well. And how do you fight injustice and how do you really support justice without becoming politically involved? Uh, you just, it's a must, but it's not Republican versus Democrat. It's, is it just or is it unjust? If it's unjust, not only uh, is silence uh, bad, it supports injustice. So that's why we have to act, and it's a matter of justice, uh, which gets ironed out a whole lot in the political realm. All right, thank you. Um, one person asked, says, I, I doubt that, that most Christian nationalists would uh, identify as such. We have, I think we have plenty of people in politics in many places who, who fit that, that are in our local and national figures that we could probably say who are, who are probably white Christian nationalists. Um, how do you resist um, you know, the narrative that they are giving and the ideology that is coming in the public sphere. What can we do, those of us who are not in the public sphere, what can we do to counter the narratives that are out there? I mean, I think the most important thing to do is lift up your narrative, why you believe what you believe from a biblical perspective or whatever your faith tradition is. So be proactive and say, you know, I believe that God created us all in God's image and for human flourishing, and therefore, everyone has access to the ballot box. You know, and so when you're doing that with friends and neighbors and in your community or in a letter to the editor or even an op-ed, you are bending the arc of the universe toward justice. So being proactive about that vision and a lot of, there are a lot of folks who play this game of like, oh no, I'm not a Christian nationalist. And then some like Marjorie Taylor Greene are like, yeah, I'm a Christian, you know, buy t-shirts with Christian nationalists on it. Um, but there, there's kind of like a, uh, they, they like to have plausible deniability, you know? So kind of like Trump would say, oh, you know, very nice people marching in Charlottesville and then say, oh, and then, you know, and the, talk out of both sides of his mouth. That's just plausible deniability. So when you're saying that you don't want church state separation or you want us to be a Christian nation, you are a Christian nationalist, right? But the more important thing is, you know, I mean, we can, it is important to call them out, but definitely lift up your vision of what we need to be because I think um, people respond better to that and they realize if they're afraid, and a lot of people are acting out of fear, right, and feeling marginalized themselves, if they're, that, that is reassuring, they can think, oh yeah, that's actually kind of a lovely image <laughs> instead of us all turning on each other, you know? So that shows some leadership. Uh, what do others think? 
Uh, I would just add that uh, I agree that uh, we need to live out uh, the beloved community, which uh, I, th I believe that we see as uh, an inclusive uh, community that recognizes the dignity of every human being. And, uh, and we have to live it out so that the people around us uh, may not agree with us or uh, will argue with us, but uh, I see Micah, for instance, and uh, congregation-based organizing that clearly is interfaith and uh, Christian and Jewish, Jewish and Muslim uh, living that out and people knowing that uh, I belong to and lead uh, an organization that has a Muslim woman as the leader now of uh, our Religious Leaders Caucus and that has uh, three or four Jewish synagogues as part of it uh, is my way of saying this is the beloved community and we are going to live it out in every way and every aspect possible. Yes, and I'll just like to add to that. You know, I found that it is very difficult to make people see who they are, and especially if you benefit from a system. So why would uh, someone acknowledge or claim to be a white Christian national nationalist when they benefit from that system? And I've also learned that you know, I'm not going to put a lot of energy in trying to convince, convince someone uh, who they are. I'll put that energy in convincing myself and my community uh, who we are. And we are not who they say we are. And so our voices have to rise above theirs. Because again, you can't convince them or tell uh, an individual, because think about it, their faith I guess, or their motive has convinced them that they are doing the will of God. You see, when you believe that this country was pretty much found, blessed, endorsed, and, and um, um, anointed by God, and, and so that's hard to change that narrative. But we have to keep doing what we're doing like here tonight, these voices coming together to say that, no, this is not what faith looks like. This is a, a political ideology and movement that is designed to advance a certain group of people and hold another group down. All right. How do you deal um, with the fear of talking to someone who is a white Christian nationalist. <laughs> I don't know if you want to answer that, Reverend Butler. Sure. Um, well, we did a workshop yesterday in, in Waukesha, right, on... Um, yeah, and conspiracy theories like QAnon, but also there's a lot of overlap between QAnon and Christian nationalism, white Christian nationalism. And so we use this method called Clara, which is you center and take deep breaths and pray a lot, right? Because you need that courage. Um, you listen, which is hard to do, right? But but you listen and you listen with some empathy. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you're... Um, well, so you listen with empathy and, and connect with what's underneath, because a lot of people are being drawn into these ideologies out of fear, anger, uh, instability, right? And then you, you try to empathize a bit from your own experience. Yeah, you know, I have a hard time trusting science sometimes too, or doctors, or I had a bad experience, but, and then you respond. So the, the R in Clara is respond. Uh, with information or maybe with a common belief system like scripture or your belief in God, the image of God that, you know, talk about that and then ask questions and, and you kind of continue that dialogue. You set limits on the conversation. Your goal is really just to introduce a seed, plant a seed, you know, and to approach them with kind of love and, um, you know, sort of um, 
you know, understanding kind of the pain in their lives. And so, so I have a handout if you want on Clara, but it's, um, but, but that, you know, if we, if we get into debates and if we're pointing the finger and trying to win a debate, you already know this, <laughs> right? I can see the look on your face. <laughs> Oh my. Because we went off, you know, with the family and the whole thing. Oh. And she went off to church because the pastor said she wouldn't be, um, you know, this is, this isn't for me. And I'm concerned my knees are the same way now. And several other friends. And it's like, because you're hearing things like one pastor has said during, you know, the sermon, saying, you know, we have to do something about Need to get somebody because they're in, like, indoctrinating the four-year-olds, and we've got to get somebody. And I'm going, wow. Oh my you know, God! Yeah, that's terrifying. And then I'm in waffle shop, yeah. which is <gasps> well. We should talk later. We should talk afterward, yeah, and because uh, my heart goes out to you. I grew up in Atlanta and uh, in the South, and a number of my family members are like that. So we'll talk. Okay. Yeah. Good. That would be nice. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, email. So, um, so another one talking about social media platforms and um, and provide the cloak of amenity amenity for uh, white supremacists and other alt right groups. Um, with hateful messages and um, organizing. Um, so what can be done uh, regarding social media and their influence um, so that we can really have real perspectives and, and not a kind of a canned message perspectives that, that we get through social media? So the part of the question is what what can we do uh, to counter to, to counter the influence to counter the influence that yeah. the white supremacists are using, are using like on there. Twitter or Facebook? Yeah, I mean a lot of that has to be done, I think, on a governmental level, and some of what was done to uh, pressure Facebook and for a while to get people off Twitter that was actually very successful, and they saw a drop in sort of adherence to Christian nationalism, and it also helped with the midterm elections. And of course, that's hard because of the way these corporations work, uh, and their bottom line is money, right? And then you have people like Elon Musk who come into play, you know, and sort of take over Twitter and start like reversing everything and making it playing to Christian nationalist types. Um, I think the only the thing we can do, and maybe others have other ideas too, is to um, kind of educate people about social media so that they're not drawn into it because it is kind of like a cult. And these algorithms work to lock people into a particular worldview. You know, so if you click on a Christian nationalist thing, I used to worry about this with my own son and watch him like a hawk on the internet, you know, because you click on one thing, then it takes you to the next thing and it takes you down the rabbit hole, right? And locks you in. And so educating people, students and schools. Um, and I always wonder about our congregations. Could they be incubators of democracy and train people in some of these skills, especially as our schools get hijacked, you know, by censorship and the kind of stuff that's starting to happen here? Can, can our congregations actually be teaching our youth groups how to be good citizens? Does that have to be part of our role? All right. All right, here's another question. In um, my community, they have banned certain books already in my community. What can I do to stop this? So I don't know the particular community, but partly, you know, get active in those, and you, you may have some, but get active politically, you know, and organize your friends around that, show up at, you know, town halls and school board meetings and that kind of thing. And it, it makes a big difference, you know, like in Florida recently, there were some parents who showed up because they had elected the school board, but then the school board was getting rid of the superintendent they all loved who was actually a Republican. That's how you know extreme they were. And uh, everybody showed up and they're like, what the heck, we voted you, but not, not to do this. You know? And so that makes a difference. Um, 
Uh, part of me is like, you know, go to the local co coffee shop, put a sign out and say, we're doing a book study on this book that was banned and invite people <laughs> into it. That would be fun to do. Um, but find people you can work with on that. Yeah. And I would add to that, you know, most of the uh, positions in our school systems are elected officials are either appointed by someone who's elected. One of the things, that, among many things that I appreciate about MICA as well as other organizations is that knowing that there's power in numbers. And when we come together as a faith community and voice that and lay out our expectations and stand on it. Uh, listen, I don't know of too many uh, elected officials or board members who don't want to be re-elected. And so we have to, we have to stand. And the other thing is that uh, we have to challenge our churches too, our, our faith, uh, the entire faith community, our synagogues, our temples to also maybe implement that as a part of the ministry in your church, in your, um, in your organization. Because when I think about uh, St. Matthew, well, I served well before I got there, and I'm great, grateful tonight to have attorney Roy Evans here, who is a civil rights attorney, a member of St. Matthew, who actually stood with me during the time that my son stumbled across a noose here in Brookfield. And when I felt like everybody had turned their backs on me, he was, he, he was there. But he can give the history. He can give the history of how St. Matthew played a major part in uh, civil rights, uh, um, you know, during, during the time of, 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 um, of uh, the education struggle, voting struggles. And we, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think St. Matthew had the first freedom school in the city of Milwaukee. And so it is through that that we were able to, they were able to educate our uh, young boys and girls and help them to understand who they are and face that reality. So I think, again, Standing up in numbers, that is power, and then implementing within our congregations those things that can uh, make a difference. Uh, yeah, thank you, Pastor Shaw. I think that's right. Uh, I was going to say that, you know, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, a group of Unitarian Universalists were aghast at how poor the sex ed curricula was across the country. So we created our own. And to this day, it was a joint effort with the United Church of Christ, but to this day, the most comprehensive sexuality education available in this country is through UU and UCC churches. And um, I think if books are being banned, we have an obligation to create our own church libraries and have book clubs on them and have discussions about why knowledge in and of itself is a spiritual good. And it can start in the local congregations or the interfaith groups. I think that's a very important resource. Uh, another question. Um, where we're at right now, are you afraid that what we could do, you could lose your, your tax-exempt status by the work that you do? Um, for us, no, uh, not, because um, we're very careful about that. Like, you can lift up your concern around the issues, as a 501c3, you can't endorse candidates, but you can talk about, you know, your concerns around voting rights or, you know, that's free speech. And so if ever we're, you know, worried about the lines, we have an attorney that we go to and we run everything by them. So we're super careful about that. Let me ask, are you asking that in the nature of uh, being attacked, even if we are following uh -huh. the rules and the guidelines? <laughs> Tax exempt. Tax exempt. Tax right. exempt status. Right. right, and if someone comes at us, that's what I'm asking. Is yep. that the yes? Well, you know what? It's it is always a concern. It's always concern a concern. I mean, um, but in life, some make some tough choices. We have to make some tough choices, and so we have to keep fighting. And then if they come out with the tax exemption, then we. We, we fight that. <laughs> and when I say fight, not in a violent way, but we, we resist that. And we, um, we make known that that is something we will not have. That's right. Call your attorney. <laughs> That's right. Call your attorney. <laughs> 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 
Well, what, what I really uh, am concerned about is that I think some churches and some pastors and some religious groups are quiet about justice issues because they're afraid of losing their tax-exempt status. This is unbelievable. I mean, if any group ought to be willing and ready to take risks, first of all, it should be the faith community. But secondly, as long as we're talking about justice issues and injustices, that is not contrary to the, the tax-exempt status. And if it was, call your lawyer. And I'll say one thing. The reason why I would not fear that is because they're doing it too. So, if you, if so yeah. they do it more so than we do. So I, I don't see that ever happening. Yeah. There have been very, very few suits yes. of that kind anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. All right. Um, is there any kind of closing thoughts that you would, I'd like to just go down and see the panels just to give some kind of closing thoughts that you would, you would have um, for folks so that, um, so that they can, um, keep involved and keep engaged in the work. Any, any kind of fi final thoughts? I'll, let the, I'll popcorn it, whoever wants to go first. Well, one, I'd encourage you, if you're not a member of some of the groups here, definitely join up. You shouldn't be alone in a time like this. Um, it's, this is a moment in history, and you're, we're going to need each other. So join these groups. Um, Faith in Public Life also has a democracy campaign. Um, I'll be selling my books out there, and I have a reading list, too. So if you uh, like the material, then sign up for my reading list. And um, just be sure you're linking to one another and joining in solidarity. And never forget the power of your voice. I, I'd echo that about relationship. I mean, the, the, the world changes through relationship, not through individual, individual action. And um, something I've learned in the interfaith work that I've done is that you don't have to agree with somebody on everything. In fact, you only have to agree with somebody on one thing that you want to work together on. Right. And then, and you can let, leave the rest of it aside as long as you can decide that one thing that the two of you can work together on. So that, that's where I would encourage folks to go. Definitely, and I'm just kind of piggyback on that. Uh, or, there are organizations out here, and of course I'm going to um, make my pitch for Micah view of Milwaukee congregation uh, to, you know, unite and come together so that we can take a stance against injustice. Because one thing that I've come to understand that um, injustice for one will be injustice for all because if they can have their way with you and your issues, they'll come knocking on my door. If they have it with me, they'll come knocking on yours. So we have to pull together as a faith community to stand up against social injustice. I would agree with everything that has been said. And I'll just add that in order to keep the fire in the belly going strong, uh, we really uh, do need to maybe have a, a, a personal uh, uh, connection in mind because you really fight for your son or your daughter. You really fight for that member of your congregation because that's very personal to you. It's very real to you. And I want you to know that I begin every day in my private uh, uh, reflection and meditation remembering Denise McNair, uh, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Addie Mae Collins. The four girls who were killed in the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. I uh, helped with Dr. King uh, in conducting the funeral for three of those four girls. That will never leave my mind. If you want to know why I am active as a 90-year-old clergy person in justice work and will not stop until I have no more breath or I'm no longer in my right mind. It is because that fire is in my belly. And I think you heard this from Dr. Shaw uh, with his family be so closely involved in Marion, Alabama with the, sh with the horrific shooting of Jimmy Lee Jackson, uh, which really led to the Selma to Montgomery March 
uh, it's, he's got a fire in his belly. So get, get that fire stoked for justice, remembering the injustice that is cloaked today uh, in all kinds of uh, outer trappings. But the Ku Klux Klan is indeed the Proud Boys and all those folks who marched on uh, the Washington, D.C. On, on December 6th, uh, just a different d time and a different cloak, but keep the fire stoked within you. Mm. Amen. All right, I think we've also heard that again. We gotta keep the fire stoked. Give it up for our panel, our wonderful panel. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, panel. And so I will let the, I will uh, ask our panel. They can go back to their seats, and then um, we will be inviting up David to uh, give us our call to action. All right, and at the podium, David. Thanks. I think first we should just give another round of applause to our panelists and uh, just So we want to ask you and this co this counts for you too the people watching online uh, to do some really concrete things uh, coming out of the, of this experience tonight. There's a plethora of bad ideas coming out of Madison these days. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. There's a, and we don't even have time to go into all of them. But I wanna lift up two things that are before the legislature right now that really touch on some of the symptoms of the things we're talking about. If you look at the back of your program, those of you who have one, um, it's on there. The first one, Senate Bill 10, by the way, I want to point out, these things all look benign on the face of them. When you first look at it, it looks like, well, of course, we want to keep harmful material away from children. Like, who doesn't? But what this is really about, it's about banning books from libraries. It's about you know, limiting access that young people have to literature. And it's about the government creating some standard that's going to create fear in librarians, that's going to create fear in schools. It's the same story you've heard a bunch of times before. As somebody pointed out, if you take a look at the letter of what SB 10 says, if it gets passed, they will have to take the Bible out of the libraries. They'll have to take Shakespeare out of the libraries. It's just, you know, it's, it's very extreme. So this is a bill. So far, it's a Senate bill. It means the assembly doesn't have a number on it yet. But once they, they, they move, they've been moving things very quickly. So this is basically just a call to contact your legislators, your, sen your state senator, your state assembly person. If you use that QR code, it'll kind of take you to what you need. If you don't want to use the QR code, it's really easy. Just Google Wisconsin State Legislature and click on who are my legislators. And it'll, it'll take you there. Let them know that you oppose Senate Bill 10 and you want them to oppose Senate Bill 10. And also, SJR9, that's a joint resolution is what the JR stands for. And that's that they want to put an advisory referendum on the ballot uh, for this April. In the advisory referendum, it starts off, talk about sounding benign, it starts off and says, you know, we don't believe that schools should teach that any race is inherently better than another. And it's like, okay. That sounds good. And then it says, and that no one should be made to feel that one race is more responsible than another for past uh, injustices. <laughs> and that, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's basically this whole thing of, you know, poor white children are going home feeling bad if they're taught that, you know, this is what our people did to somebody else's people, uh, that this is what it is. And it really is an attempt to censor teaching the truth about racial injustice in our past and present uh, in our schools. Kind of cloaked in this sense that if we tell children the truth, they just can't handle it. So therefore, we have to protect them from the truth and just teach them platitudes uh, about our history. So these are two things that are really insidious. This is how these things kind of get in. Because if they, pa if they put this out there, 
People look at it, it looks benign. At first blush, it looks like this isn't any kind of a big deal. They vote for it, it's giving the legislature then kind of the authority to kind of move forward with those. So we're just asking you to take a minute to, to do this, to contact. It does make a difference. You know, if you can make a phone call, it's even better. But if you send an email, that's okay. But reach out, if you send a letter, nobody gets letters anymore. Some letters can be helpful as well. But reach out, let them know you're a constituent. Let them know you care. Let them know why you care. Be sure you identify yourself. But this is something that if all of us, including all of you online, we're, we're, we're watching you, um, you know, that uh, if we all do this, it can actually make a difference. The third thing is, on the very bottom there, is the take a faithful stance for equity. This is the thing that we talked about, that we have these uh, meetings online every month. This month we're not having it because we're doing this. Uh, but usually every month, about this time, it's the second Tuesday of the month, um, we get together, we talked last time about the state Supreme Court and some of the things there. We kind of talk about different topics uh, every month. If you want to get on that list, those of you, when you signed in here and it said, do you want to be on the mailing list? That was the mailing list. We're asking if you want to be on. So if you want to be on the mailing list so that you can get notification of these things and can be part of it, and we're really kind of trying to build and maintain a statewide community where people can be empowered. And we also have a little pledge we're asking people to take that if in your particular town, something comes up that you will step in and you'll let us know so we can find some other people to step in. Because I think as you found in places like Kenosha with things uh, going on in your school board, when people get together and push back, we can push back. There's not that many of them. <laughs> there really are more of us than there are of them. It's just that our people don't tend to show up. If we start showing up, and that's what this is about, it's about creating a community that pledges to each other that will show up when there's some kind of a threat in our community, in our school district, or whatever, in our libraries, we'll show up and we'll make an attempt to let other people know so that we can all come out. And the final thing I'll say is, remember Reverend Butler has her books out there? So you may want to pick up a book because, you know, I'll play the sympathy card. Any books you don't pick up, I have to carry out to my car. <laughs> and I mean, look at me. I, you know, I can't carry many books. So everybody pick up a book. So again, thank you all very much, and I will turn it back over to Lisa. Thank you, um, David, um, uh, for that good call, great call to action and telling us how that we can uh, get involved. So there's lots for us to, to do. And so I invite um, Reverend Stoneberg to come up and, and to give any other your perspective and closing remarks for us as we go out into the world to do our justice work. Reverend Stoneberg. Wow, it's just so great to be here tonight and hear these voices and get a little bit of that fire in our bellies, right? Um, those of you who don't know me, I'm new here and I've come here from almost two decades in Canada. And when I've come back to the States, I friends have said, well, what, where are you going to live? Are you going to live in Canada or in the States? And I said, well, it will depend on the politics and it will depend on health care. And um, I have a third thing to add now. It will depend on what I see in my fellow compatriots in terms of power and action to fight what's going on here. So it's so important for us to take back this country um, for justice. And I want to also just a final word of thank you for being here, for being among the people who are showing up tonight. Um, I can't name everybody, and um, I'm confused by all the organizations that are involved, but it's so incredible that they've all come together, that this beloved community group out of MICA, is that right, um, was sort of the impetus for bringing Reverend Butler here. Thank you so much for coming to Wisconsin and talking to us and taking this time with us. Yeah, let's get it. <laughs> so for closing, I've chosen the words of Andrea Hawkins Camper, a UU um, minister. It was just almost to say UU attorney. Maybe we should all become UU attorneys. <laughs> anyway, uh, UU minister um, Andrea Hawkins Camper, be about the work, and I'm going to um, paraphrase it a little bit. May we see all as it is 
and may it be as we see it. May we be the ones who make it as it should be, for if not us, who? If not now, when? This is the answering, this is answering the cry of justice with the work of peace. This is redeeming the pain of history with the grace of wisdom. This is the work we are called to do, and this is the call we answer now. To be the barrier and the bridge. To be the living embodiment of love. To be about the work of building the beloved community. To be a people of intention and a people of conscience. Let us take our powerful voices, join together in community, and be about this work. And with those words, I extinguish our flame that I know can never extinguish the warmth of community and the light of love and the fire in our bellies. May it be so. <laughs> well. <laughs>